just to demonstrate it very quickly. If you have a, <coughs> a ring like that, and you're, this is a place, and you move about it, you the same surface, you come back to the same point. This is place or time. If you move ahead to the future, you progress. If you go to the past, you go to your memory and so forth. A, a person called Mobius in the 19th century did something that became quite magical. He twisted this, okay? Everything changes with this very strange device. And that device become like that. If you're here in a place, you're outside, and you move about this Mobius, you come back on the other side. But you haven't really left the plane where you're moving. You are in your present. You are in your future. You are in the future. You keep going, but you end up on the opposite side from where you started. This is place or time. Nothing changed in your perspective. But the reality is everything changes because if you're here and you want to be there in the far future, you have to do one thing. You have to puncture that plane is your reality to arrive on the other side. If you want to go in progression, you go, you go a day, a year, 10 years, and you're still, you don't realize anything. You haven't moved. You think you are on the same plane, but you are on the other side of your own reality. That's what the avant-garde does. And of course, this one can be twisted many times. As long as the twist is one, it can be very complex, but you're still doing the same thing. You start at one point, you end up on the other, other end. Okay, so that's what's on the screen here. So that's your, uh, this is your reality. And the Mobius, which I had demonstrated here, is really the one that moves you space or time around. And to really do what I was just describing, you have to rupture, rupture, meaning you create fat blarabi, to rupture your reality to, to create the future, to be on the other side of your reality. And that's what creates for any creative person is it creates what I call rapture. There are two very similar words in the English language, but rapture is elation, that you actually create something great. You are uh, uh, creatively and uh, uh, conceptually, you've done something that's never been seen before. It's a rapture. So you have to really rupture to be able to create that rapture. And that punctures or ruptures through your memory. Because if you're going into the memory uh, bank of your experiences, you have to almost throw it away. You have to break free from that because you're loaded with memory of other people's experience and you fall very easily into the mediocrity because you're relying so much on the experiences what has been established and the avant-garde is doing the exact opposite of that the opposite is that you really throw everything that you've learned away that sounds radical that sounds crazy but ideation and conceptualization meaning someone says ah oh, i have a great idea Okay, can you turn it into a concept? Of course, those in the audience who are architects, artists know exactly the difference between an idea and a concept. An idea is an idea. Anyone can think an idea, but then it doesn't work. A concept becomes more formalized and becomes like a concept. You can work it into the details and then you make it into a project. That can be also a project for the sciences, for the arts, and so forth. <clears throat> so in this Mobius that I have on the screen, which is a very complex one, similar to this one, and it keeps twisting and twisting, but as long as the twists in the plane of your reality is one, you end up on the other side, which is very key, to puncture through that rupture to create that rapture, which is if you are practicing any of those creative endeavors, you actually have to break through those membranes in this more complex image is you make through and you go through the twists and turns to really, you see those lines are going under here and it's going above there and you're actually changing your perspective in life to actually arrive at the other side of what you perceive as your reality. And you see it here. And that Mobius thing, it's here shown in a very simplistic way, but this can become very, it's a topological thing, it can be very complex and it can blend and twist and turn and become very different. It's not a simple plane. This is a very simple device just to demonstrate a point, but actually it can become a lot more complex than that. And it can go on and on and on. 
our references usually are historical, sociological, geographical, geological, methodology, mythology of the ancient mythologies, cultural anthropology, and the list can go on and on and on of your references where you're actually plunging into. So those different contexts can create ideas. And they're based on two things in, in anyone who's actually thinking, if you have knowledge, knowledge you know I know, I've learned this knowledge. There's something else parallel to it, which is more complex, it's called gnosis, which that you just know intuitively without learning it. It's, it's a very old uh, term that is gnosis, it's actually Greek, it's coming from Gnostic. Gnostic comes from it, meaning you know, you just know. The, the inspiration just comes to you without going through the typical, organized, logical steps of knowing. I know because I learned this in class. I have done this before. I've seen this written in a book. And that's knowledge. Gnosis is absolutely, you practice Gnosis without knowing it, actually. It's an inspiration that comes from a lack of direct, logical knowledge. And it can be very also complex and you go through twists and turns and so forth and you find yourself rupturing the common plane of reference. The French philosopher Deleuze calls it the plane of eminence. You have to destroy that commonality. And Gnosis helps you a lot more than knowledge. I'm saying something that's counter academic. Academicians would actually hear this and scream and say, you're crazy. You're telling the kids to not obey what we're teaching them. Now take the knowledge, put it in your knowledge bank, learn about it, know it, just keep it here. But really rely on your intuitive, parallel to it, your intuitive, not just the intellect. I think this is somehow related in a different way to what Salma was talking about. I mean, she may use the word emotional, I use intellectual and intu intuitive, and those are different terms, but they're probably pointing at the same thing. And again, in, see, I'm now progressing in, different modes in the vernacular meaning your culture the arab islamic culture the european latin culture the vernacular our tradition stay with the tradition i'm not mocking it but it really is keeps you staying within this very cozy place and then you go into the contemporary and then you become experimental and then boom you're in the avant-garde you're basically almost denying all of this but you're not because the mythology that stored in your repertoire, in your cultural references, is there. But it's not your mode of operation. But it's there. There in the memory bank, but it's not actually. So you go into the avant-garde, that's what I'm talking about, which actually on the opposite end is mediocrity, where you actually stay nice and obedient, and you listen, and you do like everybody else. You don't want to stick out because I'm good. No, you're mediocre. That's, that's the, the, the sad reality. <clears throat> and here comes a very important quotation that I love from, again, the French philosopher Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze and Philippe Cotari. He says, arts, sciences, and humanities, which pretty much cover just about everything we do. Humanities could be philosophy, it could be poetry, but arts, of course, are diverse. And the sciences are hard sciences. You're a, a physics, a physics, biology, what have you. He says, philosophy, science, and art want us to tear open the firmament and plunge into the chaos. The key term here is chaos. And of course, plunging into, you just diving into it without calculating, without thinking too much. And that's when knowledge kicks in that I am thinking too much. I've learned this in class. I have to do it this way. No. Plunge into the chaos. And chaos is not Anarchy, and that's key. And I've, sadly enough, the word chaos is always badly translated in Arabic to fauda. It's not fauda. Chaos basically is, is this zone where on the quantum level, it has the potentiality of creating great orders, but you don't perceive it as such. Chaos is everything that's in our universe on a micro, micro, micro level, in the quantum level, every surface you're sitting on now or touching literally looks like that. It's in turbulence. All the atoms 
are actually moving constantly. Just anything you're touching now. It changed a little bit in biology, the cell. This is based on physics. So this is the chaos we're talking about. It's actually perfect order, but when you deep, deep down, 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 it really turbulent. That's constantly creating order or changing into different order. Chaos on the cellular level, cells meaning in the biological uh, sense, also, but that's the human level, that's our perception. All of us live in the zone, our perception. That's the scale which we call the mesocosm. Not the microcosm, not the macrocosm. In that case, your perception, this is actually smoke from a cigarette, uh, a factory. Uh, the smoke is constantly shifting and moving, but it's not, it's, it's actually a form of chaos, apparent chaos, but it has a perfect order of the organization of its atoms. And then we go to the macro, 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 which is the cosmos, the largest scale that we can perceive. Then you have the galaxies and so forth, which appear to be uh, chaotic, but they are not really because if you zoom in, zoom in, you find a little blue ball like our Earth here, and it has its own natural perfect order. So what we see as chaos in the macro scale is actually rather a great potential of constantly shifting to a greater, higher order. So it's not fauda, it's not anarchy. Chaos, which is chaos, sometimes it's used in Arabic to differentiate it from the word fauda, is absolutely a necessary aspect of our creative endeavors to actually understand what and then the probabilities become, <coughs> the potentialities become probabilities when we begin to conceptualize them. Then you have a set of probabilities or possibilities. And then someone else, a great philosopher, not Leibniz, the 19th century, 18th, 19th century, came up with a concept that's very interesting. He called it the incompossibilities. Maybe those are too heavy of terms and you think it's like too much philosophy. And he said, this, what we perceive in this reality is the best of all possibilities that God can come up with. But it's not the only. Incompossibilities meaning there's so many parallel possibilities happening at the same time. And to demonstrate this one, if Alexander the Great did not come to Egypt for one reason, he just fell ill before leaving Greece, the entire history of mankind will have changed, not just Egypt or Greece or Hellenistic culture. Everything in the whole, just for one act. This is just a simple example. So that's not a contradiction saying so many things happen. Like right now, today, if you did not come to this talk or went to another talk, something here could have triggered you, making you, could have made you angry, upset, or happy, or wow, that's what I'm thinking about, or you go to another talk. That moment is an incompossibility because there is another one of you somewhere at this moment listening to the other talk in the other stage. That's incompossibility. And there's thousands and thousands and millions of incompossibilities, meaning they're not just possibilities. They're happening at the same time. And one of them only is perceived by this reality. Sounds a little heavy, but in, the multi in that our universe, there's another multiverse parallel to our universe going through black holes and so forth. Big stuff physicists talk about now all the time for the last 50 years. And that's an incompossibility on the macro, macro, macro scale, the big scale. On the biological level, all of what I've been talking about, I use physics a little bit more hard, and physics is something that we can perceive more. In the biological scale, is something else, because the basis of biology is the cell. The basis of physics are atoms. And we may think, okay, is our universe made of atoms or cells? Obviously, cells are living beings, whatever they are. It could be a little cockroach, it could be you, it could be a big elephant. But these are all based on cellular. But something crazy happens. If you go this way into the microcosm, the cell suddenly at one level becomes a bunch of atoms. If you go this way, if you will. But if you try to go the other way, a bunch of atoms together do not necessarily become cells to create living beings. Something happened at that threshold. Why, when I go this way, I can analyze it, understand it. At one point, cells cease to be living entities and they become atoms, carbon-based atoms. If you go the other way, there's something happens, a bifurcation is like, why a bunch of atoms continue on to become planets and a bunch of atoms 
continue on to create cells to become you or a big elephant. That mystery is still the greatest mystery in science to date, is what is the force that creates that differentiation or bifurcation between biology-based and physics. There's a great writer happened, <laughs> wrote two books recently, very recently. Uh, his name is Yuval Harari. He wrote one, it's called Sapiens, and he's talking about the story of us from now till the beginning of time of mankind as we know it, Homo sapiens. And then recently he did, did the sequel to it, which is called uh, Homo Deus. It's a big title. Homo Deus, that we become the gods of ourselves. Deus from God, Homo is us. And he says, from now on, we are at a very, it's a very critical theory now, at a very critical moment that we are, for, for the first time in history, we are engineering ourselves to evolve, deliberately understanding evolution. In the other sense of going from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, we do not, we were not aware of that. We were just following the natural selection, if you will, and evolution. But now we are actually doing something amazing. We are genetically engineering artificial intelligence with the makeup of the modern humans that we are, we are actually creating a new type of human. And that will be in a span of relatively few years, not thousands and millions of years like when the Homo erectus became the Homo sapien and then became modern humans. We have to find a different word than modern men. Apologize for the ladies, but modern humans, there's no other term yet, but then modern humans now are engineering themselves knowingly or unknowingly. Of course, there are ethical questions about it. How do you fool around with the genes to create a better looking person and so forth, but it's much greater than that. And we will become what is now called transhuman. And that's really the next phase of evolution, but it's actually, we are the designers. And that's why he called it Homo Deus. We are the gods or the gods of our own evolution. We deliberately and knowingly uh, doing that. It's a cyber evolution, basically. It's not the natural evolution that happened before. It's a very, uh, uh, based on the uh, uh, artificial intelligence and so forth. And if we go throughout history, and I, I will start with Albert Einstein, and what he did, he actually created the famous relativity theory, and he stu got stuck. Einstein had no clue his ideas in physics and the universe and relativity, how to mathematically and geometrically apply them. He literally had no clue until he met a person, a friend of his, another science, I told him, he told him, you know what, Mr. Einstein, to really do what you're doing and understand the mathematical equations and physics, you have to look at what Riemann has done 50 years ago. Riemann is a German uh, mathematician who understood something called the topology, meaning, Everything that's curved, that's not plain. And he basically said, everything we do since Euclid is we do our geometry and mathematics based on a perfect plane. And that's the exception in our universe. There is no such a thing as perfect plane in the cosmos. Everything is warped and curved, and that's what Einstein was talking about. The universe is expanding. It's the warped uh, space-time continuum. But he had no tools of mathematics and geometry to understand it. He stumbled upon what uh, the curved space phenomena that uh, Riemann did, and he broke with the Euclidean geometry because basically that is. And he stumbled upon all these curves, and the curves, if you see this sphere, something really funny happened. He decided, if this is the Earth, and if you have lines going from the North Pole to the equator, you have a 90 degree here. And if you have another one next to it, it also meets the uh, the uh, the uh, also at 90 degrees. Then there is a triangle when they meet at the top, has 90 degree plus 90 degree. Then there's a triangle with more than 180 degrees. How does this happen? In Euclidean geometry, it's impossible. A triangle has 180 degrees, period. In reality of the topology, every triangle on curved surface had either more or less than 100 degree. Only in the perfect incident of perfect plane that the Euclidean case happens, which is actually Everything we were doing for centuries was based on that false premise. And of course, Riemann created a lot of surfaces that now we can do it on the computer with his equations, actually very complex equations that he can. And you can see it in history, 
an architecture, they did apply these geometries on those curved surfaces, but they did not know that concept. They applied it intuitively because every geometric form on this dome here in Cairo is based on topological geometry. So it doesn't actually, it defies all the, if you go to Iran, if the pattern is on a perfect surface, is actually, you can apply Euclidean. If here, it becomes very complex and it has all these small curved surfaces and it becomes very, a bubble of soap has the same thing. Only the case of the perfect line could happen between two bubbles that the line between them have perfect pressure, then it becomes a perfect plane. That's the exception. Everything else is actually based on the Riemannian geometry, which is really our reality. This is a soap bubble, basically, and topology is the key thing. Okay. The universe, we thought we were the center. Earth was the center. Obviously, this is all false. Either the Arab culture or the European culture had very premises. And then we realized that Albert Einstein, when he was talking about his theories, that this is our galaxy. We are way, way at the edge, at the edge, at the edge of the Milky Way, and we're nothing really with a little dot between millions and millions of stars. And that's what Albert was talking about, is he had exploring the universe, two galaxies crashing into each other, creating, okay. So, so basically, all of that goes back, I'm gonna go fast, to people building up upon other experiences. So Ibn al-Haytham did the, the vision of the eye, and then Leonardo took it from him, and he created uh, his theories. Then Edwin Hubble created the big Hubble, understanding the Hubble, telescope understanding how vision works and how he can create lenses and so forth. This is all building up. And then you have Elon Musk now doing his scientific things. And he says, okay, I can take the rocket up and bring it down. No problem. NASA couldn't do it. But we know, I'll be fast here. Where did Elon get his? It's from 1010. Every rocket in 1010 went up and came down, went to the moon and came down and came back to Earth. No problem. So Ellen wasn't really inventing anything. You know, he was just looking at 1010 and says, okay, if 1010 can do it, I can do it. NASA couldn't do it because NASA stayed with the norm. You can't do it. Money can't pay for it and so forth. And Blade Runner, the famous movie and so forth. So basically, all of these great inventions moved over the camera obscura from the sciences to the arts. And then this man, Jules Marais, in France was creating an experiment to understand how we jump in space to understand the anatomy of our bodies, was using the same principle of the camera obscura, but he created his own camera and so forth. It's called chronophotography. So basically, Marcel Duchamp in the beginning of the 20th century is an artist looking to break free, the avant-garde of the art. Everything's so static, I wanna break free. He looked at it, Jules Marais was doing an experiment, he says, what the hell we're doing? I'm painting the woman nude sitting, but she must be thinking we're going somewhere. And he created his famous nude descending staircase. And that's the one that broke the norm of abstract art. Totally changed it overnight. In one show in New York, he did this woman descending a staircase coming from the scientific experiment from another French man. And then he basically became all abstract and so forth. Okay flashing at me, and then Marcel uh, Picasso did the Cubist thing. All of that jumping from different field to the other. They are born from each other, but then they can, they can make those breaks. What Duchamp did, he did not wait. He actually went straight. He punctured, ruptured the plane. That's what the avant-garde is. It's just not to go progressively nicely until you learn from the other person. But you basically break free to create that notion of well, Picasso, of course. Picasso is a little bit less daring and not, it's not a very popular opinion, but and Salvador Dali created a very uh, unique Christ that nobody else did that Christ. His Christ did something amazing, Christ that never looked at your eye. He was not saying, Eli, Eli, Lima Shabakhtani. He was just looking away. And that's an unusual Christ. Nobody ever did this Christ, that Christ before Salvador Dali. And he's also affected by science in the fourth dimension because his cross was actually moving in all directions about the ascension of the soul and he removed all blood, no stigmata, no blood, no sacrifice. So anyway, I was just trying to demonstrate what the avant-garde is if you're actually in the sciences, if you're in the art, if you're in the humanities, is you break free from the restrictions of what they have taught you. Don't follow your knowledge but really let the intuition 
That's what makes you puncture and rupture through the plane of reference that you're actually using, whether you're Salvador Dali or uh, Marcel Duchamp. So basically, and Escher did the same thing. So I'm just going to leave you there because there's so much to cover, but my, my talks are always too long for hundreds of slides. But, that's not, but that gives you the idea about what I mean by the avant-garde. You just open up the firmament and plunge into the chaos. All of what these guys have done is literally chaos by everybody else's. No, 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 no. not yet. Okay, thank you guys.